So you've been lied to, Protestants. We've been told Martin Luther and John Calvin returned us to the faith. They did nothing but create a brand new religion. It's a brand new religion. Luther took out four books of the Bible because he didn't think they were legit. He took out James, Hebrews, Jude, and Revelation. Now let me ask you, who gave him the authority to do that? He did not have the authority to do what he did. And when he was asked to come back into the church, he said no. Why? Because Martin Luther wanted to be the new pope. And he succeeded in inventing an entirely new religion. So, howdy all, this is Kyle Whittington. Um, we are here with a special guest today. I've got Scott Clout uh, with me from uh, Zootown Church in Montana. Uh, some of you guys might recognize him from like all these clips of his that have been going viral. Uh, just kind of talking about uh, the Reformation, uh, things in Catholicism and Orthodoxy. And uh, so anyway, I thought that I would just uh, bring him bring him onto the show. Uh, talk to him, get to know him a little bit, and uh, see what's what's going on. So, Scott, thank you so much for joining. Yeah, you were one of the first to reach out, so I figured I would give you the first one. So oh. I got a few more lined up after this, but uh, you're you're the first one. Okay, well, awesome. Well, hey, uh, <laughs> you know, I'll I'll definitely hope hopefully you know all this that's been happening just comes for the greater glory of God. So, um, you yeah. know. I, I I hope you get some bigger and bigger and better shows than this one. So, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't look at it that way. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, but anyway, so uh, just one thing I want to just start out is just kind of talk about like a brief overview of your entire life, um, and just you know how you came to Christ, how you started taking your faith seriously, or if it was <laughs> always a serious time and uh, serious presence in your life. Yes, I, I was born in a small town in Montana called Haver, Montana. Uh, it's on the High Line, kind of by Canada. And uh, my mom, my mom was a devout Protestant, uh, mm -hmm. but my dad wasn't. My dad grew up in a super fundamentalist um, Protestant household, which kind of pushed him away from the faith. But he wasn't like against God or nothing, but it just wasn't a part of his life. So uh, my mom would drag us to church and... I always believed um, in God and Jesus, but it wasn't like a main focus of my life, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And then when I, you know, I had some pretty serious trauma when I was about 12 years old, uh, I had a couple of things happen that I probably can't mention here, but I did have a, I had a kidney removed. I was born with three kidneys and I didn't know that. Um, oh. So I had a, they, they went in there and they found that I had two, two disease kidneys so they took two out. Now I only have one kidney. Um, and then I just, in that same year, some crazy stuff happened. So that kind of set me in a, a, a different way. But I was an athlete uh, my whole life. Like sports was like my main thing. Basketball was my main thing. Um, and when I turned 16, my mom said I didn't have to go to church anymore because I was a man. So I stopped going to church. It wasn't a part of my life. Again, I wasn't against it. I just wasn't, it just wasn't like an important thing to me. Um, and then I got into college and, uh, I did a bunch of drugs. I, I played college basketball. Mm. Um, and I started doing psychedelics and I drank hard and all that stuff. And, um, my dad got cancer when I was a junior in college and it really just kind of sent me kind of for a loop, almost worse than I was when I was. And, um, he ended up passing away, but he gave his life to Christ before he died. And um, I kind of watched this progression. And during that whole time, I mean, it's a huge story, but I met, I just kept meeting these guys along the way. And this this one guy invited me to a Bible study and uh, me and my roommate went, we, we went stoned. We got high and went to our first Bible study. And uh, we, we walked in and it was pretty amazing. Like they, they all knew we were stoned and they never said a word to us about it. They just opened the Bible up and started talking. And so I got to know this guy. Um, and the craziest part was uh, January of 2004. Um, I was super messed up. I was just, I was messed up. And, and during one of my basketball games, um, I was playing basketball at Dickinson State University in North Dakota, and my parents lived in Idaho at the time, so they drove all the way to North Dakota to watch this game, and I hadn't seen my dad in months, and he he was a big guy. He was like 6'4", like mm -hmm. military guy, like big dude, and when he got out of the car, he weighed like 170 pounds, and like I just, 
I, I like lost my mind. Like I just couldn't handle that because he was just dying in front of my face. So it was like the perfect storm. We were playing our rival and uh, that night this guy like pump faked and he was a, he was a full blooded Sioux Indian and he pump faked and I landed on him. And while we were on the ground, he elbowed me in the face and mm. I grabbed his ponytail and just started beating the piss out of this guy. Um, Cause I like, I flipped it. I just flipped the switch and I ended up fighting. I was punching coaches and players. I mean, it was, and it was, and it was a packed house. It was like our rival. It was a big deal. So I got kicked out of the game, obviously. And I went down the stairs and I just like, I just started freaking out in the locker room. And I remember after the game, I walked upstairs and my parents were standing at the top of the stairs and you could just see it on their face. Like they were, they were scared. They were afraid for me. Mm -hmm. Um, because I was clearly not doing well. Um, and I should have got kicked out. I mean, I should have got kicked out of the league for that. Um, yeah. and not only that, but I had the whole Sioux Nation writing death threats to me for beating this guy up. And uh, they wrote this huge article on me in the Bismarck Tribune, how I'm this tyrant and all this stuff. Um, but that was kind of a turning point for me because the, the commissioner of the, it was the DAC-10 at the time, he had to drive to Dickinson and meet with me to see if I should be kicked out of the league. Oh. And I told him what was going on. I said, my dad's dying. I'm super messed up. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, he shared the gospel with me right there. Wow. And he said, he was like, I, I sh you should be kicked out of the league. But he goes, I'm going to show you grace, but I got to suspend you. Like I have to suspend you. So um, I was suspended for two games and my team went on a road trip and I lived in this trailer in the middle of this wheat field in North Dakota. And I was all by myself. And I just told God, I was like, all right, God, I believe in you, but you have to prove yourself to me. You have to prove yourself to me. And like thing after thing after thing just kept happening. And again, this is a, this is a long story. I'm telling it very short, but oh yeah, um, I gave him up to Christ in that moment. And um, about my, I didn't even know this. My roommate, who was my best friend, gave his life to Christ and didn't tell me. So we both were Christians, and we didn't know we didn't know that. And uh, so, fi so I, finally, we both noticed like we weren't partying as much and all kinds of stuff. And so finally, one night, we're like, we're both Christians. Like we both are giving our life to Christ. So three months later, uh, it was Easter. And we're like, you know what? We're Christians. We should probably go to church. So we got in my truck and we prayed in my truck where we should go. And we landed at this little church called Hillside Baptist Church. It was a five point Calvinist church mm -hmm. um, in Dickinson. And I walk and this, my best buddy was black. And he, he was like one of the only black guys in Dickinson, North Dakota. <laughs> and, yeah. So we walk into this church, man, and they're all in suit and ties. And I got my hat backwards. My boy's wearing a LeBron James jersey. <laughs> and they stared at us. And we were like, my buddy's like, we got to get out of here, man. But this pastor like left his conversation and walked up to me and said, I've been waiting for you. And I was like, so my buddy's looking at me like, we got to get the hell out of here, man. Like we're going <laughs> to die, you know. And so he goes, can I give you a call after the service? And I was like, sure. So he called me and he said, Scott, I was at that game that you got in that fight. And he said, I got up and I was going to come to the locker room and share Christ with you. Um, but the Holy Spirit said, don't go to him. I'm bringing him to you. And three months later, I walked into this guy's church. So, wow. Uh, yeah. So he, he, was a, he was my mentor for probably 10 years. He ended up dying of cancer mm -hmm. uh, about six years ago, but he was a five point Calvinist. Um, so that's how I was trained. I was trained in that, mm -hmm. but he was a wonderful man, just a wonderful man. And um, he would come over to our apartment and we had like bongs and beer and like porn <laughs> and all that stuff everywhere. And he would like just flip over, he'd flip the nudie magazines over and put his Bible down and just teach us the Bible. And wow. he never said a word about anything else. Um, so that was the start of it. So that, that was actually the start of it. And so um, I was going to be a fireman. I went to, I went and got all my, um, after my dad died, I moved home. I got my degree, but then I was going to be a fireman. And uh, so I went through all the classes. I had a job lined up and I got engaged to my now wife. And but so I'm, I've always been kind of a crazy guy. 
So before uh, before I got married, I was like, okay, I got to go do something crazy before I get married. So I moved to Guinea, Africa for a month. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you guys know anything about Guinea, but that's where Ebola started. And, right. Um, it's not like lions and tigers and bears. It's poverty. And it was right during the blood diamond thing in Sierra Leone. Mm. And Sierra Leone and, and Guinea are, are right next to each other. So I we were there for a month and I was digging wells and, but it was like a war country. It was war torn and there was refugees coming in. Um, and so on our, we had to drive eight hours to Conakry. I don't know if you ever seen the movie blood diamond. Uh, no, I, I'm kind of Jackson. familiar with the story. Yeah. Yeah. So he flew into Conakry. That's where I flew into. And on the way back, we got held hostage by the military and it was just a really big deal. But, while I was there, I watched this, um, this, these doctors, I went on a medical mission and like they were doing Bush medicine though. I mean, I saw people get their wisdom teeth taken out with no anesthetic. I mean, it, these people were tough. They were yeah. tough. Um, but I, I watched this Muslim lady go in for surgery because she couldn't have any more kids. And she was like 20. I mean, she had to be in her early twenties and she had like six kids already. And so I'm standing there with a mask and I'm just like handing tools. And when they cut her open, she had a wall of chlamydia like this thick. And that's why she couldn't have kids anymore. Mm. So they sewed her up and I watched this guy trans. They speak like a tribal French. And so he translated mm. to her husband that she can't have any more kids and they were all Muslim. And so I then watched after, right after surgery, I watched him basically rebuke her. And uh, the missionary told me she's now going to be basically the house slave and he's going to go take another wife. And yeah. my mind like could not comprehend that. I just, I, <laughs> I just, that just didn't make sense yeah. to me because I'm kind of a justice guy. I hate injustice. I just hate right. injustice. And so I wasn't even supposed to leave the camp, but I ran out into the woods, into the jungle. I mean, there was cobras, all kinds of stuff. And I met the Lord and I heard the Lord's voice clearly. And, um, he said, he said to me, like, I want you to do what they're doing here in America. And I mm. didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that meant. So anyways, it's a huge long story, but I come back, I tell my wife, I'm supposed to be a pastor and all that. I tell my mentor and, and he affirmed it and he just goes, yeah, I've, I've known this for a while. Um, and so what God meant by that was we, I always find it interesting in America, we always say like, if you build it, they will come or like, right. we do everything we can to not to stand out from the world. And I don't mean purity. I mean, like we're kind of, we kind of judge the world a lot. Right. But whenever we go overseas, I had to wear pants. It was like 110 degrees. I had to wear pants in Africa because they, it, it would offended the Muslims. So we bend over backwards when we go overseas. But in America, we're like, no, we don't want to be a part of culture. <laughs> you know, right. uh, And so that was I. We I got my degree. I got a master's degree from Crown College, and I got ordained in the Alliance, the Christian Missionary Alliance. Mm -hmm. um, and we started a for-profit coffee shop in downtown Missoula called Zoo Town Brew. Uh, Zoo, Missoula's nickname is Zoo Town. That's why uh, that uh, name is. Uh, it's really yeah. weird, but Missoula. It's a crazy town, so it's called Zoo Town. So we started a coffee shop church and it was a for-profit business and then we would do church out of it on sunday and it didn't really go good the first couple of years and then all of a sudden it just like turned a corner and we were doing four services on sunday one on thursday there was a line of people lined up to get in and uh, that was kind of the start of the whole thing um, when we were with the christian and missionary alliance so that's a that's about 15 years worth of <laughs> wow uh, um, but yeah so that's how that's how it all started yeah no it's uh the the one thought that i had in this is just hearing like all the crazy stuff you were doing when you were younger uh matt frad says this all the time i don't know he probably stole it from somebody else but he said you know when god <laughs> laid out the plan for your life he took an account he, he you know he accounted for your stupidity and it sounds like for you it's just like yeah no this is it's not a you know Picking out anybody on that basketball roster who would end up in your shoes, you'd probably be about the last guy anybody would have expected. Absolutely. So Absolutely. that's that's amazing. Mm -hmm. That that is. And I will say, God, like I like what Richard Rohr, you know, uh, Franciscan monk Richard Rohr says. He says God God uses your sins to your advantage. In God's genius, He uses your sins to your advantage because they're your teacher, and they actually 
what I realized was like, I, I always had a strong mind you know, on one hand. Like I was the guy that could drop acid and sit in a room by myself and no one even knew that I was on acid. But I would process things and my brain would go to like these deep, deep spiritual, mystical things. And although they were on drugs, after I got off drugs, I can still process deep, you know, mystical, spiritual things. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge advantage to me, which is why I believe God knew all along I would be leaning towards Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy because you guys get the mysticism part of all this, you know? So yeah, I actually even see those early years in that like God was using that to train my mind and my soul to think bigger, like to think, to think from a 30,000 foot view. Um, Cause that's what you really need to have with the Christian faith, especially in Catholicism when you guys are across cultures, languages, right. you know, like you got to think bigger when you, when you think of the gospel. So yeah. does God actually used that in my life to help me think bigger. You know, had you told me that, about this time last year, I probably would have rolled my eyes, but you're not the first person that I've heard say something like that. Um, there's a there's a guy who lives here locally. He was actually on Pines with Aquinas. So if you look up the Stephen Johnson interview, he he's got a wild story, too. But he talks about like how he was doing psychedelics and whatnot. And it actually like part of that was a uh, uh, he said, like, there's a deep <coughs> in there. Uh, or what it, yes. I, I can't remember what it was, but he was just like, but it resonates in Catholicism. So, um, mm -hmm. and he, uh, I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying that it's right yeah. to do that, but what oh, I'm yeah. saying is, um, it, I believe psychedelics are a cheap way to God. Like, I do think it does open up the spiritual world, but it's a cheap, there's no discipline in it. There's no, there's no killing your passions, right? Like, it's right. just like, boom. But he's right, man. And I don't care what anyone says. I, I took mushrooms one day, one night and I was laying on a baseball diamond and it was a beautiful night. And I, I mean, anyone who's ever taken mushrooms, it's just a, it's like your brain's going, wow, 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 wow. And <laughs> you don't just snap out of that. You don't snap out of that. And all of a sudden I snapped out of it and I was completely sober. And I felt the presence of God come over me and he wasn't mad at me, but I felt really, really small. And he, all I heard him say was, there's more than this. There's more than this. Mm -hmm. And then I was totally sober for five minutes, feeling the presence of God. And then I snapped out of it and I was, I was stoned again, but I remembered that moment. And so I agree with them. Like it's not, it's a cheap way to God, but right. God uses anything. God will use absolutely anything to draw you to himself. So yeah. Yeah. He no, uses our sins to our advantage. Yeah, and you know, you you talk about. I'm not telling oh, everyone to go to drugs like either. Yeah, no, this is not a this is not a, a go do drugs. No, definitely not. And probably <laughs> at that, this this video is already demonetized. But whatever, um, <laughs> but, whatever. Um, but yeah, no. It, it, and then some people might take away from that as like, oh, look, if you do drugs, you'll end up like this or whatever. You'll so become a what, pastor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so no, that's yeah. not what I'm saying. Yeah, no. What no, I'm no. saying is. You know, like I've, I just view Christ differently. Like I think Christ mm -hmm. goes with us everywhere. I think Christ is in us. So like, you know, people, people who go to strip clubs, they think Christ sits in the car. Christ goes in with them. Right. And Christ is with that strip club, and Christ is with that bartender and, you know, so that's just what I mean by it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, it kind of, kind of like speaks to a deeper truth too, is that like all joy, all goodness, all pleasure does ultimately come from God where Satan comes in is where he gets in there and he twists it and he distorts it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think it's in, it's in, uh, the screw tape letters. CS, CS Lewis mentions like, Oh yeah, we can't create any happiness. We just kind of let that happen. Um, right. because then we can do that. So, but he's like, if we could do the same things without any pleasure, we'd do that. Uh, but totally. so, so even if like you've got that rush or whatever, like the goodness is still from God, it's the, the evils and the distortion of it. But yeah. Totally. yeah, so, okay. So you were mentored by a five point Calvinist. Um, was how, where was like Catholicism or orthodoxy? And I, I, the, the similarities are so close to me. I don't know if mm -hmm. you view them as really all that different. Um, I do. And I actually have, I have the benefit of not because 
uh, I mean, one thing, you know, one thing I learned when my video went viral, which we didn't even make that video, which is kind of funny. Like we weren't even the ones who made that video. Like I, I did that sermon series for our church. Right. Um, because I live in a town where the Protestant community is the most toxic Christian community I've ever seen. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's just disgusting. I, 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 it's, it's hard to describe until you're a part of it, but I, I've talked to pastors who have moved from out of Missoula to Missoula and they're all like, what the hell's going on in Missoula, Montana in the Protestant church? Like mm. it's divisive, it's slanderous, it's fake. And then there's all these beautiful people kind of wrapped up in it, trying to make it work, you know? Um, so I think that's, that's kind of first and foremost where you have to understand that video was for our church because our church has just been getting hammered and being called heretics and right. you know and we went through a church split we went through a church split because of this and it was just the divisive ugly nasty protestant mess um, yeah so i just want to make that clear that video was not i wasn't promoting myself i wasn't i didn't even know that video went out i woke up one morning and my phone had absolutely exploded oh <laughs> that's how that happened yeah. next thing you know random so, dudes in ohio are sending you emails and you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. oh dude so, that... but yeah as a flag point calvinist like i I and I grew up with a grandpa who was a strong Christian, but he thought Catholics were, you know, heretics and the Catholic Church, you know, sure. Rome, all that stuff. So I was I was trained that you guys I never I mean, and one of my best friends growing up was Catholic. He's a wonderful dude. I'd still love him to death. But yeah, I was just kind of trained like Catholics are doing their thing, you know, but we're Protestants, you know. Right. Right. So okay, yeah, yeah, actually like and I know a lot of Orthodox would probably squirm at this, but personally, like all of their stuff is compatible with our theologies too. So it's just like yeah. the door's open. So like, I don't really see that much of a difference. So, okay. But and I don't hear any Orthodox ever really trashing you guys either. Like in my circle, they don't, they don't do that. God bless you because that means you spend probably very little time online. <laughs> oh no, I've seen that. Yeah. I've seen that. But I will say this, man, I'll be honest with you. One thing that this whole experience has, I, that has taught me, is I've met a lot of assholes in Catholicism too. And Correct. I've met a lot of assholes in orthodoxy. So yep. I, that's the one, I, I'm, I, it, it cured me of looking for the perfect church. And that's yeah. not what this is about. You know, you know what, what is that? That's something like, I would, be, I would be a saint. I would be so holy if it wasn't for all these sinners around me. Uh, so right. yeah, so I'm yeah. I'm one of them, I'm one of these assholes. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but, uh, but yeah, no, whenever you're describing the scene in Missoula, it's just like, oh, it sounds like, it's the internet, but in real life. Yeah, so. pretty much. Oh, geez, that sounds okay. Um, okay, so when did you, so if, if, if y'all haven't seen the video, I, I recommend uh, checking it out. Uh, I listened to all three parts of the sermon series. Uh, it, a lot of really good stuff in there. Some stuff that, you know, a lot of you guys will go, well, I, I don't, you know, but like, it was really cool to hear, honestly. Um, and so when did, what, what prompted this? <clears throat> um, about seven years ago, we held a Easter service at the Adams Center, which is the biggest stadium in Montana. Okay. And uh, we packed it out, like it, it, it packed out. And um, we, we baptized 178 people. Uh, they wrote a huge article in the Missoulian. I mean, you can still Google it and find it, the article, but, um, and everyone was celebrating and it was like this pump up day. And in the Protestant world, again, I don't, your audience probably doesn't know some of this, but in the Protestant world, numbers, numbers and flash and bang and, and, mm -hmm. and the show, like to them, that's what equals success. That's success. Like not discipleship, not deep, you know, it, I mean, that's a whole other Protestant podcast, but right. So point being, we had arrived, we'd arrived according to Protestantism, you know, mm. and everybody came out of the woodworks. What's funny is when I started the coffee shop, everyone trashed me. And then when it worked, I became their poster boy in Protestantism, especially in the Christian and missionary Alliance. And so they just used us, they use you, you know, as mm. like this model of success. But everyone was celebrating, and that next day, I was completely miserable. I was totally oh. miserable. And I kept, I kept kind of blaming Satan and all kinds of things, but like there was just something in my heart that just wasn't right. So I got on my porch, and it finally just hit me. I was like, like, is this it? 
have I arrived? Is this it? Like, is this the pinnacle? Is mm-hmm. And is this what even church is for? Like, we just baptized 180 people, and I didn't know any of them. Mm. I didn't know any of them. And then I realized the way we were talking is it wasn't even about the people. It was just proving it was about us. It was about our egos. It was about our show. It was about because that's Protestantism, man. <laughs> and so it was all about like, okay, now we can tangibly see that God is with us, right? And mm-hmm. it just wasn't working for me. And this, there was things that I'd thought about for a while and I'd read in the scriptures that just didn't line up for me, but I just didn't try to think about it, you know? So I get on my porch and I said, all right, Lord, like, is this it? You know, like, yeah. am I doing good? Am I, am I, is this? And I, I heard him just say, there's more, you know, there's probably mm-hmm. five times in my life I've heard him instantly. And I said, Lord, I just want to know the truth. I told him straight up. I go, Father, I just want to know the truth. And I heard him say, I will tell you, but it will cost you. It will mm-hmm. cost you. And I had my Peter moment where I'm like, oh, I'll go follow you anywhere. And I'll never betray you. You know, <laughs> you know? Um, and that was the beginning of it. And to be honest with you, these books just started coming in my way. But I also told Christ, I lay everything down. I lay my Americanism, my Montanaism, my patriotism, my everything. I lay it all before you because I want to know truth. And I, the, the book that actually started it all for me was The Divine Conspiracy by Dallas Willard. Um, even if you're a Catholic, you should read that book. It's, he's, he was a Baptist Calvinist, but he, he wasn't. He was, it, it's hard. To, he's just a mm. beautiful man. But in that book, he goes through the Beatitudes and how it's the kingdom now. Like the kingdom is now and we're supposed to be living the kingdom life now and turning the other cheek now and being meek now. And in Protestantism, again, I just speak for Protestants. I don't know what Catholics believe, but Mm -hmm. Protestants almost have this view that all that the gospel is, is to save you from God burning you. Like that's all it is. God's Mm going to burn you in hell. So say the prayer so he doesn't burn you. That's the entire point right. of the Protestant gospel. And it's and so then you're in this constant limbo and it's all about morality. Um, and it's just a really kind of weird game. And this book said, no, no, no. The kingdom's now and God's mm-hmm. redeeming this planet. And we're a part of the kingdom now. In Protestantism, it's, you know what? Someday we'll die and he'll make us perfect. Well, no, that throws out everything you guys are doing with your, you know, disciplines and ascetics and all that stuff. So that book totally changed my view. I was like, holy smokes, like yeah. the kingdom's now and, and we need to be participating in this now. Um, and then it just kept going from there. And then, then I started reading the early church fathers and it was a wrap. Like I was like, okay, I'm not teaching. I'm not even teaching the atonement theory, right? Like I'm not even teaching the right atonement theory. So these dominoes just started to fall um, hell was a big one for me, you know, when I started studying the early church view of hell mm-hmm. and the afterlife, what that was. But penal substitution was huge. I mean, yeah. when I dumped penal sub, it freed me so much because it never made sense to me. It still doesn't. It's it's it doesn't make sense, you know, mm-hmm. um, because I'm a logical thinker, and basically, penal substitution pits the father against the son, <laughs> like, right, on the cross, and, right. And, and that, when I dumped that, that was a big one, but that's what started the, that's what started the ball rolling for my staff and the other pastors to start calling me a heretic and having secret meetings and all kinds of things. So, oh, goodness. um, yeah. So I, and then I read Brad Jerzak's book, um, a more Christ-like God where basically Jesus is God. Jesus showed us exactly who God is, not mm-hmm. Moses, not Elijah. Those, those guys did the best they could. Right. But they weren't, they weren't, they weren't God and Jesus. So basically I, I shifted my whole thinking and reading the Bible where I take Jesus to the Bible instead of the Bible to Jesus. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. So like, because if you don't do that, you're going to start lumping things that Moses said onto Jesus. And Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, but I say he was correcting Moses is what he was doing. Right. Now that's not a knock on Moses. It's just, Jesus is the perfect word of God. So that, that was the one when I started reading the Bible through the lens of Christ that, you know, that made the Bible made more sense to me too. Cause there were things in the Bible that just, I'd never made sense. It just, it, why would God 
do that? Or why would God say that? Or, you know, and Jesus opened that whole door up for me. And so then I started going to mass. Um, I just was like, hey, I'll check this Catholic thing out. And I started going to mass on Tuesdays. And, and then I started going a couple of times a week. And I just realized I had misjudged the Catholics tremendously. And I didn't know what I was talking about. And I was an ignorant fool on what Catholicism was. So um, I started going for years, just going to mass and listening to it and watching it, but then experiencing it. Like just, it, it's an, you're, it's such a different experience than Protestantism, <laughs> like, uh-huh. you know, the liturgy and all those things. So um, I just read probably a hundred books on all these different stuff. And uh-huh. I was convinced, but I didn't know what to do because I'm a Protestant pastor. Um, but fast forward and I went through a church split because I was branded a heretic and to this day I'm still a heretic in this town and all that. But um, I've now, I'm now mentored by uh, Father Hightower at St. Francis Xavier. Um, mm-hmm. I signed up for the Catholic, it's called SEAL, a SEAL class uh, through the Jesuits. Um, so I've been doing that for the last seven months. Okay. And so, yeah, and yeah. That's, that's my Catholic part of it. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, cool. So uh, what you mentioned uh, a little bit about, you know, the kingdom now, we actually do have this idea in Catholicism called the social kingship of Christ. And it, it, okay. it's basically exactly that. Like when you say Christ is king, that's not a he will be. king. <laughs> he is now. And that like that's a reality uh, because everybody, you know, we love Christ, our brother. We love Christ, our savior. And he is those things. Uh, you know, we love Christ the therapist, but whenever we're just like, how about Christ the king, the guy that you didn't elect, but the guy who has authority yeah. over your life, and um, it, it's just like, he's the good king, he's a, he's the best king we'll ever have, but he is a king, and like, especially as Americans, I know we kind of struggle with that idea too, is because right. he's a leader, whether you like it or not, whether you, whether you yeah. consent to it or not, and uh yeah. So uh, anyway, actually, the 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 church that we went to when we lived in St. Louis was actually run by a religious order called the Institute of Christ the King. So that's something that they're like huge on. And like every year they do, uh, or at least last year or year before last, they did a uh, a coronation mass. So the masses that they would use to crown a king, they they celebrated a coronation mass for Jesus. Um, and it was, I mean, you had. Uh, music written by Mozart that the, they brought in the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra to play. And it was, it. Uh, whenever I did that, it started sinking in. It's just like, oh, oh, right. I am by far the least important person in here. And it's just like, oh, I don't know. It just started making it making sense to me because it's just like, it's that king subject relationship. Uh, but also yeah. the king has perfect humility too. So it's... Yeah, uh, and that's what the that's what the good news means. Yeah. That's what the good news means. It's Evangelia, mm-hmm. I believe. Evangelia, and <laughs> he was copying Rome. When the new Caesar would come into power, he would send a delegate ahead of them, aka John the Baptist, and that that delegate would go to the towns and and pronounce the good news that the king is coming. But you didn't elect him, and you have to do whatever he says. And if you don't, there's going to be punishment. So like. That's how they announced the the Caesars. Jesus hmm. is the same way, but different. The good news is announced. It's the Evangelia. The king has arrived. Mm-hmm. You didn't elect, like you said, you didn't elect him, but he's a good king. And the kingdom is going to happen whether you like it or not. So you should probably stop punishing yourself and join the kingdom because you're fighting a, a losing battle. That's really what it is. Yeah. So... That's so the difference is is Caesar Caesar would punish the subjects himself in the God's kingdom sin punishes itself. So if you don't line up with Christ and you don't line up with his kingdom and you don't acknowledge him as king, he doesn't punish you, he lets you go your own way and you punish yourself because you're not lined up with the kingdom. And yeah. that's the difference between Christ and Caesar is he he no, he doesn't he doesn't make you do anything. And that's Romans 1. Like Romans 1 right. is he turned them over to what they wanted. And that was another one like with wrath, even that word wrath. If that's a, in the West, we've jacked that word up. Wrath means it's orge, like a passionate expression of one's desire. 
So the wrath of God is letting you get what you want. <laughs> right. And you fail and you ruin your life because you're going against the king and the kingdom. So, so many Christians are frustrated, well, in my world, because they're trying to play these two games. They're kind of like, mm -hmm. they're trying to have the American dream, but they're also trying to be in the kingdom. And basically what they're doing is saying, I want the king to go along with my American dream when you just can't do that. It's just you, you, you follow the king and what he did, but he's a good king and he just wants you to be free and happy and joyful yeah. and all those things. So, yeah, um, but that's where Calvinism absolutely decimated that view of God. And this is why I can't, I mean, I, I am adamantly against Calvinism because it was birthed in the medieval era under the sovereignty of a king. And they took that view of the earthly kings and attached it to God and Jesus. And that's mm -hmm. what they did. So then they made this, then they made Jesus almost kind of a tyrant and like, he's not a good king in their world. You know, he picks and chooses which subjects, you know, it's just, it, it's, that, that was a terrible view that was birthed out of the dark ages from Luther and Calvin. And we haven't recovered since in Protestantism. But if you read how the early church viewed the king, he was a beautiful king who right. served he served his subjects, <laughs> like, right? You know, so that's uh, the the early church view is way better of the sovereignty of king. Let's put it that way. Yeah. No, you know, you you you. We always hear about the the bad kings and whatnot, especially as Americans. We you know we 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 fought to get away from the king and whatnot. But when right. if you read about somebody like King Saint Louis the Ninth, the 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 king that Saint Louis was named after, uh, like yeah, he was absolutely a. Uh, uh, a servant king. I mean, you know, he died in Tunisia because he was like out fighting with his soldiers. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah. Now, oh, there was something you said that I wanted to uh, to touch on. Oh, talking about how you know our free will plays into this, and there was a uh, I can't remember who said it, but it was quite beautiful. It was at the end of your at the end of your life when you face your judgment, one of two things is going to happen. You're going to look to, to our Lord and say, thy will be done. Or he's going to look at you and say, thy will be done. And uh, I think that was, was C.S. Lewis. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was C.S. Lewis. And, and, uh, and then I think I heard, this might be an Eastern Orthodox uh, view uh, that I to me makes a lot of sense. And if it's not, I'm sure somebody will correct me in the comments. But like how heaven and hell are kind of the same place. It's your disposition that's different. Yeah. You're just, it's just the kingdom. Right. So in Revelation, it's obvious that that's what Revelation is saying. But yeah. Um, yeah. So, but if, if you, um, what our judgment is, according to Eastern Orthodox, I don't know what Catholics think, but basically God is love. It's who he is. He mm -hmm. is love. So all is just, he is just, but his justice comes from love. You know, like, so love is who he is, you know? So when you stand before God, you will reflect, you are made in his image and you will reflect how much of the love of God you have in you. Mm -hmm. And for people on this planet who hate love, they're going to hate being around God. Right. <laughs> Their punishment, you know, so like basically what the Orthodox believe is people don't want God and they get him anyways. Yep. There, there's no running from God. Because yeah. on the cross, Jesus, Jesus said in John 12, when I am lifted up, I will drag all men to myself. That's what the Greek is. I will drag all men. So some kicking and screaming. But again, if you hate love and you're standing in the presence of love, that's your hell. That's your hell because yeah. you hate love. And, this, and we're all delusional. This is why abuse victims keep going back to abusers because they think that's real love. Mm -hmm. And so then when, the, and, and if this is proven now, then when they get into a real relationship, a real loving, they, they just jack it up because they, they can't handle real love. So that's, that's my, I mean, there's a whole other conversation, but that's what I believe are just like, even the lake of fire, it's coming from the throne room of God. The lake of fire is the love of God yeah. and it tests and it refines and it burns anything that's not of love's kind. So if you spent your whole life being selfish. And, I mean, of course, there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you watch your entire life burned away and destroyed. And I love what Thomas Merton talks about because he says that's your false self. Your false self is, is what we're trying to hold on to. And love is going to burn that away. 
And I think people can hold on to that false self for a very, very long time, possibly forever. I don't know. But yeah. either way, the judgment is just a reflection of how much love of God you have in you. That's your judgment, you know. Mm. So that's that's the orthodox view. And it's so obvious in Revelation. It says her gates are never shut. They're never right. shut. And the yeah. spirit and the bride say, come. Now you still have free, you still have a choice whether you want to enter the kingdom or not. And mm -hmm. what that looks like, I don't know, but you're not getting away from God. <laughs> you're just not getting away from God. So I'd rather just submit to him now. Yeah, that's actually, so um, are you, are you familiar with the Eastern Catholic tradition? Have you heard of this before? A little bit. Okay. A little bit, yeah. So it's actually kind of fun. Uh, one of my neighbors, he lives right behind me. He's a Catholic priest. He's also married and has seven kids. Um, okay. And he's of the Melkite uh, tradition. So it's more of like what happened in uh, the uh, like Saudi Arabia. You know, we're talking about uh, mm -hmm. different expressions all over the world. Well, so this is like the Arabic tradition. Uh, so whenever you talk about some, a lot of these Orthodox ideas, I mean, they're still present in Catholicism. In fact, uh, there's a, there's a wonderful guy who loves to hang out in the cigar lounge here in Steubenville. I won't name him. Uh, he, he'd been kind of struggling between Catholicism and Orthodoxy, but he's wearing the Orthodox cross and he runs into father Peter and he goes, Oh, are you, are you Catholic or Orthodox? And he goes, well, I'm sort of both. And father Peter goes, huh, me too. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. yeah, but like, there's a lot of richness in the Eastern tradition that like, it's technically present in the West, but it's not emphasized or studied at all and i think uh mm -hmm. i think we're starting to see a little bit of that shift uh like i mean mm -hmm. we're at the very front end of it but um just a, all this wisdom in the east and the comfort with mystery too is something that yes. uh yeah. you know it's like what are the details of heaven you know you take the thomistic approach and you know aquinas can brilliantly just list everything about heaven and all everything that we know or can suppose and the orthodox are basically just like be holy so yeah, and he, yeah. even even aquinas even aquinas said you know he had a vision he's basically like whatever i just saw whatever i've written before is rubbish i mean he and he, he just quit whatever quit he the saw <laughs> yeah so like i i don't know that's where i, I love him dearly you know but yeah. i I take some of his stuff with a grain of salt now because even he said, like, you know, I, I've seen something that has blown the doors off a lot of things. And, and that's what I was going to say earlier is I am in a unique position because I, I do consider myself Catholic and Orthodox at the same time. Um, and I know that might have, you know, offend some people, but I just see so much beauty in both of them. And I think if they just would come back together, it would be a game changer for the world like for the world, it would be mm -hmm. a game changer. Um, I don't see that. That's my prayer. But I take from both of those very, and I, I just love, I love the Eastern tradition of both Catholic and oh, yeah. Orthodox. Um, and now that I've studied it too, I mean, they're just, I, I do think some of the Latin lost some of the Greek meaning. I mean, yes. it, it just did. Like there's, you know, like the, the word eternal, the word eternal is not a time word. It's a substance word. It's, it, it, mm -hmm. it's it's aionios it comes from olam it means age of time you know so like yep. it, that's the mystery that's the mystery so but when the latin the latin took that away and so there's some things that i just wish like the if they could all come together it could just yeah. paint this beautiful tapestry and this might this might be protestant but i believe they should join so they can spot antichrist mm. Mm, yeah. I, if, if, I think the Orthodox and Catholics should join together so they can spot Antichrist. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's that. That's an effort that's ongoing. We're we're a lot closer to reuniting with the Greeks than we are, say, like the Russians, and that's most of them. Yeah, and the Serbs. Uh, yeah. yeah, but uh, I mean, one of my best friends that lives around here, uh, he's he's Serbian Orthodox. He's actually been on Pints with Aquinas a couple times. His name's Derek Cummins. I've had him on my channel before. Yeah. He's I've learned a lot from that guy and uh, yeah. love him dearly. And, uh, you know, just talking with him, like, I don't know if you ever find yourself out, out in Steubenville, which, you know, who knows that that's, uh, <laughs> that's not outside the realm of possibilities, but, uh, you never know. yeah. So like, actually, so are yeah. you familiar I with, I, I actually, I Go hang ahead. out with some Serbian Orthodox too. And I, I 
I thoroughly enjoy them. I oh, really, yeah. really enjoy them. And well, I just and, think that's where there's so much richness in all of it. And even in the Nicene Creed, mm-hmm. you know, when it says Catholic Church, it's a small C. It's mm-hmm. not a big C. It's a small C, which means there's others out there, you know, like. Right. And that, I think that's where I am. I'm blessed to be able to be in this spot, even though I do feel at some point I'm probably going to have to choose. <laughs> um, okay. I do. Okay. I just love. I just wish y'all could just come together and quit fighting online and just find the beauty of both of it, you know, because yeah. I've got, you guys both, you guys both believe in the Eucharist, the presence, all that stuff. Um, you both claim the same saints, <laughs> but well, yeah, um, it, it's and, just, I, but I'm in a cool spot to be able to pick from both of those. Yeah. I, I, I might get in some hot water for this, but I kind of don't care. I don't like doing the Catholic Orthodox debates. Uh, one, because they're so close and I'm not that smart. And it's just like, is this difference meaningful? I don't know. I can't tell whatever. So I I don't like doing that, but I also know that we also recognize Orthodox saints as saints. So like, let's say if you said, well, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to go join the Serbs. Praise be to God. Uh, You know, I'm excited about that too, because it's just like, there's still a possibility that you're going to be, you know, St. Scott of Missoula one day. And, uh, you know, I mean, you know, the chances are low, but never zero, you know, but, um, you know, I, or, you know, you'd probably take the name of Seraphim or something like that. And that's how they'd probably do it. But yeah, uh, actually, he's my favorite. That He's my favorite saint is Saint Seraphim of Russia. I love that guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I That dude, like, he got the crab kicked out of him. He used to sit with bears like that. I love those guys. Oh, yeah. 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 I don't I don't know if you're are, are you familiar with Pines with Aquinas at all? Have you heard of any of that? Pints with Aquinas. Have you have you heard of the show? Mm-mm. Okay, cool. So it'll mean nothing to you because I'm actually like in the same building where that's filmed. It's Matt Frad. He runs oh, okay. a pretty awesome channel. Uh, highly recommend it. But uh, he's an Eastern Catholic, and um, but and he's also like a big Russophile. So he's all everything's Russian, and uh, it, it's yeah. I don't know the Russian saints. Whenever you hear from them, it's just like oh, these guys are intense. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. But okay. Yeah. So they, they after it. Yeah. So you did mention you do you think you're gonna have to choose. So if you if if you don't mind sharing on camera, what's preventing that from happening right now? Feel free to decline the question too. Yeah. I am a Protestant pastor in charge of a large church that has to I am God has called me to lead these people, you know. So mm-hmm. uh, I can't bail on them. And I also, this takes time, like this stuff takes time. And yeah. also, um, I've been advised not to right now um, mm-hmm. by a couple of my mentors. And here's why. What, so I'm mentored by two Eastern Orthodox and one Serb and one Catholic. Um, and one of my mentors has told me, as soon as you become a priest, they will stop listening to you. Hmm. The Protestants. Yeah. So I am kind of a missionary arm of I'm, I'm, I feel like God has called me to bridge the gap between Protestantism and Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Like I'm, I'm, I'm here to bridge the gap in that. And mm-hmm. I, I, I speak Protestant language. So those people need that. It's kind of like, um, you know, like when, when Jesus went and talked to the woman at the well, he spoke to her differently because she was a Samaritan, yeah. you know, and so that's kind of where I'm at in all of this is I I have been advised not to because I basically I have a lot of people that I have to continue to train up and I have to I still have so many walls to break down. Um, if I just bailed or I just did that, it would be too quick. It just it would be too fast. Yeah. And so I think and I also want to just trust the Holy Spirit on exactly where I'm supposed to go and what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. Um, and so well, it's got to, I mean, this would be like you Catholics converting to orthodoxy i mean that would be that would be these some of these massive steps um but i've just been advised and i agree like i want to take this slow which isn't my nature by the way as you can tell from my sermon (laughs) series i'm a guy that just says let's go enough's enough boom yeah um but i i just feel like i have a unique ability and calling to help protestants understand the richness of catholicism and orthodoxy Mm. 
There's but we've uh, had we've had multiple people in our church leave and convert, and I'm totally fine with that. Oh wow! Have you gone to any like baptisms yeah. or confirmations? Like uh, I've been to a, I've been in Orthodox baptism and a Catholic baptism. Yeah. Okay. Was uh so I, I've seen the videos. I've never been to an Orthodox baptism. Um, I, obviously, as a father of five kids, I've been to quite a few Catholic ones, but. Um, <laughs> Did they do the did they do the thing where they take the baby and just like dunk him in the water like that or three times? Man. Oh yeah. Oh, pretty dude, aggressive. That's... <laughs> man. It's <That's> pretty aggressive. <laughs> you know, although like as a dad, like it makes me go like, okay, well, you know, oh, is this too rough for the baby? Then I watch the Orthodox do that. It's like, oh, well, you know, if salvation can start like that, then whatever just happened to the kid here is probably fine. You know? <laughs> so and I asked them, I was like, have, have you ever any of them got hurt? And they're like, no, never. And I'm like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yep. Yeah. I wouldn't have, I honestly wouldn't have the balls to do that, man. I'd just be like, <laughs> like I can't imagine just whipping those babies down, but. <laughs> that would be funny if one of you, if one of your, uh, if you're, uh, oh, one of the people that go to your church, I, the, the words, the term's escaping me right now, but um, came up to you as like, baptize them the Orthodox way. I insist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> be like, well, can I sign a, can I sign a waiver first? Before? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so honestly, the one thing I guess to put what your reasonings are into Catholic terms, it sounds like you take your spiritual fatherhood seriously, and you have no intention of abandoning abandoning the children that are kind of in your charge. And quite frankly, like, yeah, that's respectable, and I don't I don't think anybody can. Uh, well, no reasonable person can really criticize you for that. Um, so, right. And it's just like, I mean, I, I just kind of view some of this different, like remember the Ethiopian eunuch, Mm -hmm. not much happened there and I don't see God freaking out about it. So the Ethiopian eunuch comes, Philip meets him. He has Isaiah 53. That's all he's got. Well, as far as we know, um, he, he leads him to the Lord. He baptizes him right there. Philip goes away. What happened? (laughs) so like i sometimes i think we we don't trust the holy spirit in other people and that ethiopian eunuch went back and to this day ethiopia is one of the strongest christian nations in the world right and like what training did that guy get what you know what priesthood did he get you know so and i know there's a story behind all that Mm -hmm. but there is a process all that too that i don't think god's freaking out about and so i don't feel like god's freaking out about my process um, he is, he is totally okay with us continuing to move forward in this because we have, we've added the liturgy for baptism and, uh, the Eucharist, um, the Eastern Orthodox church has written a liturgy for us. Really? Like they've adopted us. Yeah. Interesting. So not only, so my mentor, father, Andrew Jarmus had to get permission from his bishop and his bishop said yes. So we we do a communion Eucharist liturgy and a and a baptism liturgy now from the Eastern Orthodox Church. Okay, that's so, pretty cool. Yeah. So that and that's where I I have found the Orthodox way more open to that than the Catholics, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. You know, I talked about my you know my 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 father here in town, the Catholic. Mm-hmm. He got in trouble. He got ratted on by one of his. Uh, one of his parishioners called the bishop and, and mm-hmm. said, hey, this guy's letting this Protestant take communion. Right. And so he, he pulled me into his office and said, I'm sorry, I can't do that anymore. And that kind of hurt my feelings. And it kind of yeah. gave me a little, I don't judge the Catholics. I still love you guys. But I can't imagine any scenario whatsoever that Jesus would turn me away from his table. I just can't imagine that. So I, I thought the Catholic view was, you know, if someone comes up in good faith, because again, what's interesting to me about the Catholic view is how do you know all those people are Catholic in the first place? Or how do you even know that they're, you know, like that they're dedicated to the church or anything, you know? So I, I, I struggle with that, that I've been denied the Eucharist from the Catholics. However, mm-hmm. I'm not going to fight the system either. And I know I'm accepted by God. I know my father loves me. Um, and I just yeah. go up and I just don't do it anymore. But that that's kind of what happened there, and I just and that made me sad. And my, my my mentor was sad too. He was like, you know, I just I just see Jesus when I see Jesus eating with people 
like in the New Testament. He was having the Eucharist with them. That's what mm-hmm. he was doing. And I never see him stop, you know, like with all, you know, the tax collectors and being like, okay, wait a minute. Let's make sure you know exactly what you're doing right now. And, you know, and all right. that. I mean, one of my favorite scenes in the Bible, bro, <laughs> forgive me, is when he's ascending into heaven. It's one of my favorite scenes because he's ascending into heaven. They're all watching it. And it says, and some doubted. Think about that, man. And some doubted. They're watching Jesus ascend into heaven and some doubted. Now, my favorite part is I don't see Jesus stop and go, are you watching this? Are you believing this? Do you see this? So I do believe that sometimes institutions keep adding thing after thing after thing. And Jesus said, you nullify the word of God by the traditions of men. And I believe the Catholics and the Orthodox have done that in some cases. However, I'm not going to fight the system and I still love everybody. And it's yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll unpack a little bit of that. So it's all based, uh, I, and you probably know the verse better than I do. Uh, but where St. Paul says, you know, they, whenever you come to the table of the Lord, you receive unworthily, you know, you eat and drink your judgment upon yourself. So whenever you view right. this from a lens of mercy, uh, the church is saying, we don't want you to be eating and drinking your judgment. We're not trying to hand out damnation here. Um, and then as far as like, how do you know, it's like, well, for the most part, you do just assume everybody who presents themselves, um, is, you know, unless you, unless you know, for some reason who this person is, if they're uh, a public center, whatnot, I don't know if you heard of, uh, Archbishop Cordelione in California somewhere, uh, said Nancy Pelosi, like will be denied communion because, you know, she supports the murder of infants. And like mm-hmm. publicly and is uh, defiantly and has said, basically, we can't let you have this because this is only going this. This isn't going to help you. It's only going to hurt you uh, to the point where, you know, St. Paul even says that some of these people died uh, because they had been doing this unworthily. So and a lot of that does come from the idea of the covenant and the. uh, uh you know, you need to be in the covenant if you're going to renew the covenant and how we renew the covenant of our initiation. So baptism and confirmation is through the Eucharist, just like in the same way that we renew the cover of uh, covenant with our wives or spouses for the women watching uh, is through the marital act, you know, the, the conjugal love. So in the same way that you won't allow anybody else who's not in the marriage covenant to partake of the body, you know, we don't we don't let people who are not part of the covenant uh, within the church uh, partake of the body either. Uh, so that's why that's why that's there, uh, because it's also a, a, a symbol of unity. Uh, you know, the Orthodox and the Catholics, we have the same Eucharist. So despite the fact that we've got a bunch of knuckleheads who are trying to beat each other down in the streets or, you know, in the theological streets, whatever, uh, you know, there's still a unity there, even though that there's a, human sinfulness is currently impeding that. Now, that's that's like the high level over, overview of it. Um, and there's some people who can go way deeper than I can because I'm just I'm just a lay apologist who's not even that bright. But that's that's sort of the reasoning. I, I don't know if any of that's new or any of that helps or if you're just over there like, yeah, I don't, I don't I'm not on board with that. So. Well, that context of that verse with Paul is they were getting drunk. Those people were getting drunk. Oh, they were absolutely, yeah. They they were absolutely abusing it, yes. When he says unworthy manner, I think he was talking about their spirit and their countenance towards the table, not the church per se. Um, And I actually disagree with that bishop who who will deny Nancy Pelosi communion. And here's why. I believe in the Eucharist. And Mm. when you deny them, what if that's the moment for her? What if she's in some liturgy and she takes the Eucharist and that's the moment where she's convicted of her evil and wickedness. So I actually, so yeah, I disagree with you. I believe you sure. are hindering people from the grace of Jesus. And I believe you are hindering people from a moment that Christ can work in their life. And so I don't care how big of a sinner Joe Biden is or Nancy Pelosi. I totally agree with you guys that that is evil and I am pro-life for life. But man, have I done some really terrible things and the Eucharist healed me. And so I'm just kind of like... Oh. When you deny someone the table, you are denying a medicine, and I disagree with that. And so I, that's that's my view. Yeah, fair enough. So, 
Okay, so what are some, uh, okay, when in our email exchange, uh, I, I said like, hey, can I send you some books? And then you emailed me, said like, hey, I got the books you sent. And I was just sitting there thinking, I didn't send you any books. So have people just yeah, emailed you books? I got two books. Oh yeah, I've, I've, I mean, I've gotten, I'm, dude, I've gotten thousands of emails and DMs from Catholics and Orthodox, um, some good, some bad. Um, uh, well. But people have sent me beautiful rosaries, and um, and I, I I really do appreciate them. Like I yeah I so right now I'm reading uh, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist. Oh yeah, I think it's called. But yep. Scott Hahn, I've actually talked to Scott Hahn too uh, mm-hmm. um, after this whole thing, and because I I am ignorant to some of that stuff, and it's a wonderful book. I'm almost done with it, mm-hmm. and I I'm doing that. I'm reading these books to educate myself, but also be able to educate my congregation Mm and why we're doing this, you know? So that was an awesome book, you know, Jesus and the Jewish roots of the Eucharist. Oh man. That made so much sense to me. And I will say in your defense as Catholics, you, in, you, in order to partake in the lamb and the, um, um, the Passover, Mm-hmm. You had to convert to Judaism and be circumcised and go through that process. Had to be part of the covenant. Yep. Yep. So I do understand that. But however, I still disagree with you because I believe that when the veil was torn and he, you know, he was on the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, that opened it up for everyone. So, mm-hmm. but that's just me. Yeah. Well, hey, um, you know, and, and like we said before, this is like, this isn't an argument. This ain't a debate because no, no, no. W- one if this wasn't I might debate, agree with you someday. I might agree with you someday. <laughs> oh, you know, hey, that'd be awesome. But like, I like to say that like, if this was a debate, you'd win. Because uh, <laughs> uh, no. obviously, yeah, but uh, no. you know, you, you mentioned Scott Hahn. He actually lives here in town. Um, they just opened up the new St. Paul Center. Uh, they've got the new building and whatnot. So I've been talking with them a little awesome. bit. Yeah, yeah. So but, I love uh, him and Trent Horn and like, all those guys because I, yeah, I actually appreciate a good debate uh, mm-hmm. because the early church fathers, I, I wish our culture wasn't such a bunch of sissies, man. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, you read St. Basil and those dudes, they would go out and hash that out in the public arena, you know? Mm-hmm. And, but they, they just did it differently. They weren't trying to fight each other. They weren't trying to, you know, like, so I wish we could get back to that. But now I look at most internet debates, like I watch Trent Horn and James White. Right. And I, I just kind of, like, I'm just like, what's the actual fruit of all this? You know, like, yeah. what, what, what does this actually accomplish except like, you know, like everyone's still standing their ground. I don't know. I, I don't know how much those actually do. I appreciate them. But at the end of the day, I don't know if Trent Horn's going to convince a Calvinist. <laughs> you know, I don't well, know, maybe. So, maybe. So, you know that I work for Trent Horn, right? So, no, I don't. Oh, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm at least I'm one of Trent's assistants. Uh, oh, so nice. you would be amazed at the amount of comments that I see. So if you go and ca- uh, comment on the Council of Trent and you see a comment that says Dash Kyle, that's me. Um, so oh, uh, watch, I've watched those. Yeah. So uh, but anyway, I, Trent thought Trent and, I thought he murdered James White, by the way. He murdered James White. <laughs> so the crazy thing is, is that I've seen just every single response i thought was i got i thought it was pretty even james white murdered him trent hort murdered him and i'm just sitting over here like yeah i I, james white was james white and trent horn was trent horn and yeah clearly i i've already decided who had the better arguments before it even started and uh i did a review of it uh on my channel and uh i i invited uh my friend paul facey He's known as uh, the other Paul online, and he kind of had that exact same reaction as you of you of just like, it's just so tiresome. It's just the same thing over and over again. We're just hashing the same points, and uh, and I was just like, honestly, I I can say that from a different perspective. Like I, because I was a Protestant, so -hmm. that's where I can see as a Catholic you going into that being like, well, Trent Horn's going to win. He did, you know. But right. I've been on the other end of it. I already knew James. I was I got trained for ten years as a five point Calvinist. I knew right. exactly what James White was going to say. I knew he already got, he already attacked me online. By the way, too. Oh, but, did he? Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I think that is a badge of honor. I thought that was a badge of honor that he, that, that, that that little that, old me in Missoula, Montana. You thought the stadium was the mountaintop? No, this is actually the mountaintop. Right. 
but I knew what he was going to do. Like you, I knew his art. I've already known his arguments. Like, you know, but I, I don't take him serious because anyone who says that God ordains rape, I don't take you serious. I don't even take you kind of serious that you know the heart of Jesus Christ. You don't know the heart of Jesus Christ if that's what you believe. But I also know how he came to that conclusion. <laughs> right. I also know, you know, all of that. So I don't, I agree with you. I, I've watched tons of those and, you know, Ortberg and all those dudes. And you're like, what is the actual fruit of this? What is this actually doing? You know, and then mm -hmm. it is indicative of our culture. And that's what kind of, that's what kind of sad to me. Like, this is a great conversation. We're homies, whatever. Right. Yeah. But uh, I don't know if you saw JJ Reddick, you know, the basketball player, JJ Reddick. Uh, the name sounds familiar. He was a Duke guy, NBA. Anyways, mm -hmm. he just came out last week and he said something so interesting to me. Because he's, he's fed up with social media culture. He said, I can do a podcast where I break down the ins and outs of defense and basketball and all that. And he goes, I'll get like 10,000 views. And I'm probably butchering this quote. But he goes, but then I can do a podcast where I tear apart a coach and what he does and how he coaches. And I'll get a million views. Yeah. And so he goes, what's wrong with our culture? What is wrong with our culture that we want to hear someone be trashed and cynical and destroyed. And if you're a basketball fan, why wouldn't you want to know about basketball instead? Right. That was his point. Right. And so I view that and it's the same way online. Like you're not, you, you probably don't even know who these people are, but you know, I look at the new evangelicals, you know, that, that guy, the new evangelicals, I mean, they got hundreds of thousands of followers. And then I see the Theos brothers. They have hundreds of thousands of followers. I can't imagine standing before God someday, and having him show me how much time I spent critiquing and judging and tearing someone apart online. I can't mm -hmm. even imagine standing for God someday. And so what happens then is then they get more views. And then you got guys like Mike Winger and all those guys. And it's like they have to give their opinion on freaking everything. And quickly. I don't give a crap. Yeah. I don't give a crap what, what people think about the He Gets Us ad. Who cares? Who cares? I don't give a crap about, you know, political stuff. So you got these people and they're the same people just on different sides of the aisles. They're vicious, they're judgmental, they're prideful, they're snarky, and it's feeding into our cultural narcissism. We are living through cultural narcissism right now and it's feeding into it. And so that's why, you know, I listen to your podcast and I'm like, that was a breath of fresh air. <laughs> or like, you know, or like, because you're talking about real stuff, but you're not trying to get me, you know? And, and right. so that's where I'm, I'm just wrestling with the whole internet podcast thing now, because I'm just going like, what is the actual fruit of this? What is mm -hmm. this actually doing? You know? And at the end of the day, I just think, I don't, I think we're kind of lying to ourselves sometimes that Jesus is going to pat us on the back and be like, way to go, way to go after James White, way to go after <laughs> Scott Clout. Way to go after Trent Horn. Like, I don't think he's going right. to say that to us. I really don't. Because he yeah. says, go and learn what this means. I demand mercy, not sacrifice. That's what he said. Yeah. So it's like, I, I just think, and myself included, I've been involved in this. And I'm just starting. I mean, I've had, you wouldn't even believe the stuff people have said to me now after that video went viral. I mean, oh, just last week, dude, just last week, I got an anonymous letter in the mail from someone in Missoula calling me a heretic. I need to repent. And I, again, I just stop and think like, what in your right mind would make you think that's what Jesus wants you to do? Right. Right? Yeah. And so, Or, at, or even like, why did you think a, this would work? <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, now I'm going to repent because an anonymous letter came to the church and I totally agree with you that Catholics are heretics. And I'm, you know, it's like, but I just see it online and I just see it. It's just, I don't know if it's building the kingdom of God and I, I don't think we're going to be congratulated for it, you know? Right, right. And well, like, there's also a certain point, like, if you want to talk culture wars or whatever, you know, Peter Kreeft has, yeah. a, has a wonderful saying, and I say it a lot. It's that when a madman is at the door, feuding brothers reconcile. And it's like, you and I, we have differences, but I've got way more in common yeah. with you than I do with the guy who wants to mutilate my children and who's right. successfully running for Congress. And it's mm -hmm. just like, okay, yes, we've got differences. Yes, they are important. But the unity and the fraternity is a little bit more important right now. And, you know, you're talking about tearing people down. I used to do this series called Low Hanging Fruit on my series, uh, on my channel. Mm -hmm. I quit doing them. 
They're fun. Yeah, it's fun. It's, you know, dishing on it. And I try to stay charitable, but I'd always end them. I'd be angry. I'd be upset. Yeah. Whoever's. Yeah. yeah. And it's just like, what good did this do? Nobody ever sent me an email from one of those and said, oh, dude, that that uh, increased my love of Jesus so much. Thank you for mm-hmm. what you do. Not not a single time. So that's yeah. why I was like, I'm not doing these anymore. They're fun. I get it. Good on you. They're good funny. On you. They get a lot of views or for my channel, they get a lot of views, but like, yeah, yeah so no, we're, we're not, I'm not, I'm not doing that anymore. No, look, there's a guy, there's a guy in my hometown right now who did a three part series called Scott Clout Refuted. <laughs> so I never, I never told anyone to leave their church. I never told anyone, I never called anybody out by name except for Luther and Calvin. Um, I did call John MacArthur out. I did call him out, but this guy did a three part series where he cherry picked all these these church father quotes and about, you know, all this stuff. And he made it personal. And I'm just going like the five people that are going to watch his, his YouTube video. Like, was that worth the six hours of study where you're, he's just completely wrong. So I even watched it and I looked it up and all he did was cut and paste off a website. That's all he did was cut and paste off. a. Web- I found the website, but I, I'm telling you, it's so vicious and ugly. Like, and you know, now I'm watching these Protestants leave the church and deconstruct. Right. <laughs> and all they and they're becoming the thing they hate. They're yeah. becoming the thing that they're judging. Yeah. Like now, all I heard was all Protestants do is talk about politics. Now, all those progressives, all they do is talk about politics. Right. So I'm like, all you've done is swing your pendulum, and you are now that person that you are judging. And so I don't want to become what I hate. I don't want to become a cynic. I and I do sometimes like. You know, when you get thousands of people telling you you're a heretic, sometimes you get a little bitter. Yeah. But I don't want to be that way. I don't want to just tear people down. I don't want to tear people down. So even the whole thing is there are beautiful people in Protestantism. Protestants are some of the most generous people I have ever met. I'm going to mm-hmm. tell you straight up. They tithe their 10%, man. They are, they are, they are lovers of the kingdom. They really do want to see the kingdom grow. They really do. So, but... I'm not attacking them. I attack the institution. And the bottom line is Calvin and Luther were heretics and they wanted to be the Pope. It's just a fact. You, you know, Calvin made it illegal to criticize him. That is a cult. That's a cult. And if anyone can deny that, that he didn't do that, then show me, but he did do that. His own son-in-law and daughter were killed because of his laws. I mean, like, so that was my point was, Yes, the Catholic Church has some some bad seasons. Oh, but sure. why are we surprised? Why are we surprised by that? Paul told us the wolves will be inside the church. Paul yeah. told us the deception will be inside the church. Why are we surprised? And then a part of me is like, the Catholic Church is the most persecuted church that's ever existed, even in America. Oh, yeah. Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson persecuted the Catholics. I mean, so why are we surprised that the Catholic church has some bad things that happen in it when there's wolves. However, the Protestant church was started by wolves. (laughs) It was started by wolves. So that's the difference. That is the difference. Like Pope Leo, I have some disagreements on. However, when you read his stuff, he was a godly man who, you know, like who was a good Pope. Like, you know, it just, which you just got, you know, they were the one during Martin Luther's era, you know? Oh, that one. Okay. Yeah. 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 So like he, he had some bad, bad things and there were some tough things, but then you read some of his other stuff and they kind of righted the ship and, you know, at the right. council of Trent. And so well, at yeah. least here's the difference. With, here's the difference with Catholics that I love about you guys. Here's what I love about you guys. You fight in house. Mm-hmm. I love that. You fight yeah. in house. I never hear, even with the people who hate the Pope, I never hear them say, uh, well, I'm going to leave Catholicism. I never hear that. Yeah. Like, do you fight in house? Here's what Protestants do because of the Reformation. We're fighting. Let's split. Let's split. Let's split. Let's split. Let's. Right. <laughs> and here we are, twenty thousand denominations later, and they don't even know. They don't even know what each other believes. You know, it's just. So yeah. that's where I think the Catholic Church has. At least you fight in house. Yeah, you fight it out in house. I, I love do. That. I do have to uh, quibble about something, and it's stupid 
because it doesn't undermine your point. But somebody in the comments is going to point it out. It's not 20,000 denominations. That same survey says that there's 200 different Catholic, whatever. There's still more than 10, and that's still a problem. You know, so <laughs> like, okay. It's like, okay, sorry. I had to point that out because I thought it was somebody, somebody was like, oh, I guess that invalidates everything you said. It's like, no, the point still very much stands. Um no, but like, see, well, yeah. okay. Can you can you unpack that? Like, so you're saying there's not twenty thousand Protestants? Yeah. Denominations? So there was a survey that was done, and the criteria that they were doing was uh, said that there were like two hundred different types of Catholic Church, and it's just like that's. It was a really flawed oh, wow. survey. Okay. It's still in the thousands, but it's not like right. thirty thousand, you know, twenty thousand or whatever it is. But it's still a lot. Uh, oh, so, see, the, the study yeah. I read was. The, how they got to that number was because even within those denominations, oh yeah, there is separation even with. So that's how they got to that number. Yeah, like, they're not saying, they're not saying like there's assemblies of God and whatever. Right, they're saying even within. So like, let's use the Baptists, right? Mm -hmm. How many Baptist churches are there? Right, in, in my town of six hundred people. So I grew up in Oklahoma. In my town of six hundred people, there were two Baptist churches. Okay. In mine, there's like four. <laughs> um, and you'll talk, I'll talk to one Baptist and another Baptist, and they both claim to be Baptist, but they don't agree with each other even on a ton of stuff. Right. So that's my, I think that was my point was, yeah. yes, I'm not saying there's 20,000 assemblies of God. What I'm saying is even within the assemblies of God sure. and within, there's all these different branches that are kind of autonomous and they're not, you know, exactly. like they're, yeah. You know, like assemblies, especially like the Alliance, I was in the Alliance mm -hmm. and my district went like full Calvinist. That's one of the reasons I left is they went mm -hmm. like full Calvinist. But then I'll talk to someone in the Midwest and they're like totally Arminian. You know, so I'm like, that's my point is it doesn't matter if you're under the banner of this. You guys don't even agree on this, 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 right. you know, all that. Stuff. Right. I think, well, I think that's how I bring those together. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. And, and yeah, like, there's no reason that a town of 600 people needs two Baptist churches. I think it, I don't know the histories of those, but I think it, it was some doctrinal disagreement. And I've, I've even heard like, there's a joke of like, well, you've got the left Baptists and the right Baptists. It's like, oh, is that like a political thing? Oh no. The left Baptist believes that when Jesus was washing the feet of the, the apostle, he started on the left foot and they believe that he started on the right foot. And it was just, right. Yeah, I mean that's obviously a joke, and you know, but it does kind of. No, I know exactly. But you're that's a that's a true joke. <laughs> oh, it is. Oh, that's. Oh, no, I mean like, oh, okay. like that's, that's the kind of no, 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 no. Like that. I mean like that's that the kind of, of pettiness. Stuff that they, yeah, that they'll quibble yeah. over and split, and and then that's the problem with you know then when you don't have a, an authority over you, you become your own pope, right? And you tear the church apart. And you create ridiculous theologies like the rapture. I mean, like, and that leaves people in bondage forever. Yeah. It's just like, so that's why I do, that's why I'm like, no, this is messed up. This isn't good. These, these theologies, these, you know, this type of stuff has caused great shame. It's caused great um, pressure and no one, it's hard in Protestantism, but no one ever really feels like they're good. <laughs> it's yeah. Just, you know, it's just, we got to do more. There's something else or I don't know. It's just a weird game. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about a, a, a silly situation that's impossible, technically impossible, but Pope Francis dies tomorrow. God rest his soul. The College of Cardinal convenes. You get a phone call. Scott, you we've elected you to be the next Pope. What's your next move? I would become the next Pope because I trust the church's guidance. So what's the first thing you're doing? <laughs> I'm married with kids, so I don't even know how that would work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're not the first Pope with children, but, uh, that is true. Yeah, I know. But, uh, what's the first thing I'm doing? Oh man. Uh, well probably moving to Rome Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what? learning, learning Latin and Greek. <laughs> Well, I mean, honestly, that's it's such a good and humble answer, too. It's just like, I don't know. I guess we'll figure it out when we get there. Yeah. No, I mean, if it, but honestly, yeah, if, if that was the case, honestly, if I got a call from like some of the big wigs in the world and they were like, God has told us you need to become a Catholic priest, I'd, I'd probably be like, OK, well, I trust the wisdom of the church. Like, you know. OK. All right. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Because I do believe I do believe Christ speaks through his church, mm -hmm. not one individual.
Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, and like, that's a very Catholic idea too. Um, it's mm -hmm. not, we don't, a lot of times people will accuse Catholics of viewing the Pope as the same way that the Mormons view their prophet. Uh, right. of like, you know, God speaks through the prophet and he can add, to, you know, it's like, no, that's not how we, that's, right, you know, yeah. we've yeah. had some real bastards sit in the, the chair of Peter before, like, right. and there will probably be a few more before it's all done. Um, but yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah. Well, anyway, that's really cool. It's funny. So I was watching, uh, Peter Kreeft, uh, he was he was in town yesterday and he was on Pints with Aquinas and Matt asked him that question and, and he's like, so what's your first move, Dr. Kreeft? And he goes, I'll resign. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I will say, I mean, it's like basically you're supposed to deny it, right? Like if, if it is offered to you, it should be a surprise. <laughs> yeah. So uh, and this is kind of you getting should, into church politics. It. You yeah. shouldn't want it. Yeah, it, it's there's a saying of like who, he who walks into the conclave as a, as pope walks out a cardinal because if they think that you want it, no. Uh, pope Francis and uh, Pope John Paul the first said the said the same thing upon their election, and it was my brothers, may God forgive you for what you've done to me. Uh, right. And there's even there's a tradition there's the crying room, and it's basically for the newly elected pope before he goes out to the balcony. You know, he gets in his white vestments and then he goes into a room and he just weeps because it's just like, congratulations, you've been put in charge of over a billion souls mm -hmm. and you're responsible for it. Like, go. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the, that's why I, I, I don't like to co criticize Pope Francis on my channel, which, you know, he has warranted criticisms. I don't want to I don't want to say that he's perfect and never makes a mistake. So he definitely has. But still. This man is the father of 1.3 billion souls. And, you know, I can barely manage five. So right. it's just like, my goodness. But uh, yeah, that, that helped me show some grace to him. And I, I have my thoughts on him. There's times I, uh, and this is my perspective as a Protestant. Mm -hmm. I actually kind of dig him, man. I like him. Yeah. <laughs> I like him. Uh, but I, I do think sometimes, again, my perspective, he'll come out with something a little more progressive. And I always know the next week he's going to come out with a little something more conservative because he has these two people probably giving him a bunch of crap. Like, so like when he, when he did the homosexual blessing, I mm -hmm. went and read the document and I read all that. And I could kind of understand why some people were unnerved by it. But I told my buddy, I go, watch, in one or two weeks, he's going to come out and do something conservative. And he did. He came out with the IDF thing. And then last week, he came out with the gender thing, you know, or yeah. talked about gender. So I give him tons of grace. That's a tough spot. Um, but I, I don't even know how you would manage some of those things across cultures and languages and, I mean – nationalistic views i just that would just be a tough gig man humanly impossible but, yeah and there but there's things he says that are so grace-filled and so loving and i just i love that about him and um i think he handles his critics very well in a lot of ways and then sometimes i think he doesn't <laughs> and i yeah. don't know i just but there's some dudes i really love some of the conservative guys i do like some of the more progressive guys and i just try to listen to both of those sides yeah, uh, to find well, truth, you know. Yeah. So. Well, I, I I like to say, you know, the path is narrow, and you know, Satan doesn't care if you're too far to the left or too far to the right, as long as you're off the path. Yeah. Satan wins. That's a good word. So yeah, that's a good word. Um. So like, I I do think like, and it's uh one of my favorite answers. Somebody was trying to figure. I was like, hey, where does the Catholic Church fall on the political compass? And the top answer to that was above it. Totally. And I was yeah. like, dude, that's perfect. I love it. So yeah, but yeah, that's where it's supposed to be. But I do, I do think I understand what he's doing mm -hmm. and meaning, you know, he invited all the transgenders to the Vatican and, you know, loved on them. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. I don't have a problem with that because what's the other option? You know, like what's the, like, I don't ever, you know, you can send them anonymous <laughs> letters telling them that they're heretics. <laughs> Right. Yeah, you know, you could tell them something that they've already been told a million times and right. it hasn't convinced them, or you can love them and show them Christ. So I thought he got a, I thought he got a bad rap for that because mm -hmm. I'm a guy, I will eat with anyone. I'll, I'll sit down and eat with anyone. Right. And 
I, you know, so I'm like, what, what does it cost us? What does it, what did it, what does it cost us to just sit down, call someone, call someone what they want me to call them and love them? That's just, that's all it is, right? Like to me, that's what he was doing, but I don't think he was affirming it all either. And, you know, so I think that's where yeah. I kind of view, I kind of view some of that, but I do struggle with some of them. Like I struggle with James Martin, man. I struggle with him. Like he's, oh. I, yeah. I just like, I read one of his books and I really enjoyed it on the Jesuits and I'm not, I'm not a hater of him, but I'm just like, what, what is the end goal of this? You know, like yeah. what exactly? Well, and is that fruitful? Is that fruitful? You know, so that's where I, I'm mean, kind of in the middle. I'll God's- break bread with anyone. I'll love anyone. It's not my job. Whatever you're doing in your bedroom is none of my business unless you make it my business, you know? Right. And that's, so I think that's the cultural moment we're in is like, everyone's making it our business. And so we have to, we have to deal with some of these tactfully and gracefully and lovingly. And at the end of the day, I am a co-equal center with everyone. That's just how I look at it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I could tell you more about uh, things that I've heard about James Martin just off camera. Cause I don't want to expose the guy who told me, but uh, it's nothing bad. It's nothing bad. It's just uh, attitudes in the church uh, toward him. But um <laughs> You know, I'm not saying like, oh, I've got dirt on some deep scandal, and uh, no, 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 none of that, none of that. And, and I'm not know, a hater of his; I just don't understand it. I'm kind of like, well, like, what are you doing, dude? You it's know? interesting. <laughs> so, uh, are, are you familiar with Father Mike Schmitz, the Bible in a Year guy? Yeah, a little bit. So yeah. he he was on Pints with Aquinas way back in the early days. He went and talked to Matt Fred, and he brought up the topic of Father James Martin, and. He said, oh, do you want to criticize him? And then and Father Mike immediately went, what do you mean by criticize? If you want me to criticize his desire to build bridges and build communities, build friendships and increase love uh, with these people who struggle with these sins, no, I'm not going to criticize that. If you want to criticize some of his methods and like he's coming across as approving of it, okay, yeah, we can criticize that. But the desire, like, no, that's obviously coming from a really good place in his heart. So I agree with that. I have no problem with with building those bridges and I have no problem with people not just coming out and slamming people either. Yeah. And you know, but I just, you know, that's just one instance that I'm just kind of like, I don't know how that fits in the Catholic church. I just don't know how. Yeah. You're not the only one asking that question. You know, and and I don't know the answer to that either. So that's just where those are just questions I have about the Catholic church. It's like, I've read the document. I know exactly where you guys stand. I read what, you know, Pope Francis affirmed that stance yeah. How does that even take place then in the same institutions? That's that's just what I don't know. And I don't I don't know. And this is where the human sinfulness comes in. It it's just like, you know, you've got this might be too strong, but weak leadership of like, you know, somebody needs to bring the hammer down or like, you know, it's time to do some disciplining and whoever's in charge hasn't. Um, you know, and we saw that back in the time of Martin Luther too. The selling of indulgences. Mm-hmm. That was like Martin Luther was not wrong on that topic. Like he was no. 100% correct. I said that correct. in my series. My series. Yeah. I said that in my series. I was like, no, nah, he was right about that. Yeah, no, he was right. Yeah. And like, that's actually, so in the coming up in the Council of Trent, like that was affirmed. Was like, yeah, mm-hmm. no, he was right here. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, so like it, I, it pains me so much to read the story of Martin Luther because it was just like, we were this close to having a St. Martin Luther on the calendar and a Lutheran order within the church. Yep. Ugh, it, it, it's just like, dang, you could have been a doctor of the church, but yeah. instead of like being humble and submitting and whatever, you were just like, let's just take seven books out of the Bible and you know, I'm just going to do whatever I want. 11. You did 11. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So the, the New Testament ones, thankfully, I think yeah. like he had enough pushback. They were, in the, they were kind of in the index. Like he took them out. Yeah. And didn't, they were kind of like, it's yeah. kind of like putting an asterisk next to him. Yeah. It's just like, and here we read from the epistle of James, you know. <laughs> Which is an epistle of straw. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah. So I agree with you. I actually think Luther, I'm not convinced Luther wasn't on the spectrum also. Like when you read some of his stuff, and I don't say that judgingly, I say that like, there's just some things that you're kind of like, what was this guy thinking or what was he doing? But what I think happened is his pride and ego took over. Yeah. And as soon as he said, St. Saint, Saint Augustine and St. Ambrose doesn't hold a candle to me. I was like, okay, like, no, I'm done. Yeah. You you have lost me there. And, and he, 
he just got really prideful. And, and there's, I mean, there's a lot of interesting, maybe wives tales about him, but like, you know how the, like it's, it's kind of known that the Protestant church started an 11 o'clock service because Luther was hung over so much and he, he had to start making the services. And there's actually people who've written about that, that oh, I mean, he drank so much that he was just, you know, he was hung over in the morning. And so they started doing an 11 o'clock service. Now, who knows if that's true or not, but we do know he, he was a pretty big drinker. You know? It is and, That is one of those things that it's just like, I, if you told me that that was just like Catholic anti-Protestant propaganda, okay, all right, I could, I could believe that. But there's also just enough believable enough. It's like, that also wouldn't surprise me if it was a fact. Um, yeah. You just read him later yeah. in life and, you know, they asked him to be a part of the church. They asked him to come back. They mm -hmm. asked him, you know, so why wouldn't he? If he truly loved the church like he said he did, why wouldn't he fight in-house? And even like James Martin, right? Like, I don't have anything personal against him. I don't know him. I've never talked right. to him. But at least y'all are going to fight it in-house. Luther didn't do that. He said, I'm going to go start this whole yeah. new thing. And that's that's heresy. It just is. Well, it, it's it's funny because... Um... You know, one of the one of the inside jokes is that, you know, in the Rome and Vatican is like Moss Eisley in Star Wars. You know, it's the, you'll never find a, a, a worse hive of scum and villainy on the planet. But it's just like, yeah, but thankfully, it's not the villains who are steering the ship. It is the Holy Spirit. So whenever it's just like, oh, geez, this leader is doing terrible things. And oh, my goodness. The the answer for or, like the question for us, for us Catholics is basically well, where else would we go? <laughs> you know, right. it's just like. Yeah, I agree that like there's some massive problems and, you know, we've got, you know, the, the roof is leaky. You know, the priest is, you know, fathering bastard children like uh, yeah. this is a problem. What do we do? It's like, well, where else are you going to go? So and uh, well, and even like, you know, Peter, St. Peter, we got to admit, dude, the guy was the guy was a racist for a few years there. St. Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. Right. St. Peter had to have a dream. He had to be called out by Paul. Now that doesn't bug me because St. Peter was a human being and he was growing and he was on a journey and he was changing and all those things. So I'm not saying this is where all these people will end up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I love all of them. Like I love Bishop Barron. I mean, all those guys, oh, I, love, yeah. I just love listening. I love listening to these guys and I love that you're fighting in house, but it doesn't. And here's what's funny about people who bash the Catholic church or the Orthodox church or the church in general about, all the scum in there. Uh -huh. Those same people will look to the United States government as their <laughs> leaders. Yeah. You have to be a complete dumbass, a complete dumbass to give your time and attention and loyalty to these politicians. They don't care about you. They don't, they, they're lying to us. And so the same people who leave the church and bash the Pope will stick up for Donald Trump or Joe Biden or all right. these people. It makes no sense to me. So I'm like, yes, there is scum in the church. I'm the worst scum of the church. And I am a complete sinner. I've done things that are so unchrist like. And so, but thank God I'm in the hospital to heal me. Right. The difference is if you stand outside the church and judge the church, you're going to the government like, tell me what I should do. Tell me what I should believe. Right. Me, you know, and it's, it's like you pick your poison and I choose the church of Jesus Christ with all her blemishes. And as St. Augustine allegedly said, the church is a whore, but she's also my mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, w I would say that the church, uh, the church is perfect. Uh, it's the people in the church that are the problem. Yeah. It's uh, the, perfect through Jesus Christ. Exactly. In Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. As the bride of Christ, the church is perfect. It's mm -hmm. the, the problems, you know, on left, right, and on the other side of the screen and the viewer. But uh, and when did Jesus ever say, I'm giving you a perfect church? When did he ever say that? When, you know, so it's like, why are we surprised at that? That he's that, you know, like, yeah, it just doesn't surprise me anymore. I, um, uh, so there was a there was a time whenever it was actually so uh, when when Matt Brad uh, had my buddy Derek on they talked about it and he was talking about the Catholic and Orthodox splits and and whatnot and he said like at at a certain point he was just feeling this strong desire for like Orthodoxy is true and this is actually where I need to go and you know he so he texted a Ukrainian Catholic priest friend of his. Uh, who's also here in the area. He's also got married. He's married and probably has like nine kids or something. And uh, 
And his response was something like, my friend, now you know what it's like to marry Gomer. Like, he yeah. was just like, you know what? She's beaten. She's, you know, in the muck. She's stained. But that's the bride, you know? And, uh, nice. and, and then there was the other point, too, of like, if you're looking for a perfect church with no problems, whatever, and you find that perfect church, let's say it does exist and you find it, you will yeah. ruin it by joining it. Have you met right. you? You're awful. <laughs> yeah, that's. The, I think that's the, um, I can't remember if it was G.K. Chesterton. I can't remember who it was, but it was like, uh, the church is full of hypocrites and we can always use one more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I love that. That mm -hmm. is. One of my one of my favorite quotes, and I'm probably going to butcher it, is by Hilaire Belloc, and uh, he talked about how the proof of the, uh, the the church's divine institution was that it's been run with knavish imbecility for the past two millennia, and yet it's still here. If this was a merely human in, uh, endeavor, it wouldn't have lasted yeah. two weeks. So, I totally agree with that, and that's actually why I believe you know the protestant church is a side thing and it's not going to make it forever i don't i don't believe it'll be around forever there'll be pockets of it you know sure. because there's some areas that the eastern orthodox and the catholics aren't and the protestants are there just really is and again the small c church but that i do agree with you one of the convincers for me was you know the catholic church has had some tough seasons and the orthodox and they're still around like, yeah they're still here and not and not only around they've grown you know, you can't say that for certain Protestant denominations. I mean, Luther's Geneva and those whole areas, they're dying. <laughs> Calvinism's dead. Like, it's yeah. dying. One of my, we had a staff member from the Netherlands, grew up uh, reformed, mm -hmm. miserably reformed. Mm -hmm. And that's why he loves what we're doing, because he's like, no, I watched this in my hometown. I watched what Calvinism did in my hometown. I watched the abuse. I watched the fear. Calvinists never know if they're chosen or not. They never know. Yeah. You never have any security. And I always say this about Calvinism. You know, I have a little bend towards Calvinism. Why would any Calvinist ever have children? Why would you ever risk that? That God wouldn't choose one of your children. Huh. <laughs> so anyways, he's from there and he goes, oh, it's dead. He goes, it's dead. He goes all over that area. There's Calvinist churches. And he just said like, it's people hate it. And so he just said like it, that even in their area, it is just, you know, it's kind of gone away where it started. You can't say that about the Catholic church. Granted, there's been times where persecution and, you know, all that stuff and mm -hmm. doesn't sound like Europe, Catholic church in Europe's thriving great in some areas, you know, Yeah. but it rebounds, <laughs> you yeah. know, and the Catholic church and the Orthodox are still growing and you, it just, it's not going anywhere. It's just net. Cause it's the, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. it right. Just won't. Yeah. No, there's, uh, uh, I do want to say though, that like you can kind of see God's providence working in the background though, because one thing, especially American Catholics struggle with that Protestants absolutely do not struggle with is a love for scripture. Um, yeah. you know, the fact that like you're able to quote scripture much more fluidly than I can. Well, I mean, you also, you know, do this for a living, but, um, it, that's something that like we, Every time we get a Protestant convert in, it's just like, oh, sweet. Uh, the, the the joke is normally like, oh, you used to be the Protestant. You got the entire Bible memorized. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, that was part of your RCI. You had to memorize the other seven. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, so that's really, really good. And yes. you were talking about the speaking the language. Uh, are you familiar with Jeff Cavins? He, he also does the Bible in a year with, with Father Mike Schmitz. Um, he hosted this show on EWTN with Mother Angelica back in the day. And he said, uh, Mother Angelica told him, uh, and he's like, well, I want you to host this show because you talk like a Protestant. And I like that. <laughs> and it's just, you know, there are some fruits happening here that doesn't excuse, but you can see why God would allow this to happen because, you know, uh, a friend of mine tried to join the Dominicans. Uh, he, he discerned out, but whenever he was in the Dominicans, uh, the new novice class that was with him, every single one of them was a was a convert. And I just thought, I just saw saw that and thought to myself, why are Protestants raising the best Catholics? Like, right. I mean, that's an indictment a little bit. It's just like, geez, man. Okay, all right. Maybe, so, yeah. but I uh, agree with you. I I actually agree with you, but I also disagree with you. Okay. 
Um, this is not a book to be toyed with. This mm-hmm. is not a book to, and so, yes, I have to give the Protestants credit, even though those numbers have gone down. They've done a right. ton of research now that like 30% of Protestants or something like that read their Bibles now. But mm. my issue with it is I, this is why God gave us teachers. God gave, I don't think the average layman can sit down and understand the scriptures that way. Do I think God can speak through them? Yes. Do I think they should read them? Yes. But I'm not convinced that you should hand a brand new Christian the entire Bible. I would give them the book of John. I would start them in John Hmm. and then I would move them out because when you had, I mean, I'm telling you, man, you hand someone the book of revelation. No. (laughs) And I mean, holy crap. That does incredible damage. And not only that, you hand the, I mean, there has been some crazy theologies made up from Protestants just reading their Bible, you know? Right. And then you have, you know, one guy does a commentary and he hands that over and it shapes an entire generation yeah. in certain theological views that, I mean, John MacArthur is an historian, an historian, man. He's an historian. That's heresy. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know what that is? Yeah. Nestorianism, right? He's a historian. <laughs> and so, that is straight. And he taught a whole generation of people out of his uh, commentary Bible. I mean, he just did. And it's like, that's, that's mind blowing to me that. So that's what I mean. It's like, yes, yeah. Protestants can read their Bible and they, they can quote their Bible. They can. And I believe God has spoke to through with, through his word sure. to them. But man, have I seen that be a, it's a weapon. They hold it as a sword. Then. Yeah. And it just divides and it divides and it divides. And then they start dying on hills that they shouldn't die on. So people always ask me, like, you know, I'm actually a very, I'm very conservative man. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I, uh, I just, the way I go about it's different. But the only hill I'll really die on, man, is Calvary. I'll die on Calvary. That's the hill I die on. Because I've just watched Protestantism die, like you said. They'll die on tongues or they'll die on how to do, you know, uh, praying over people mm-hmm. or <laughs> it's just like we need some sort of structure that lines up with this book and we need teachers and i believe those teachers were given to us by the church fathers so mm-hmm. and yeah. i'll be straight up man i it's hard for me to read protestant writing anymore because it's yeah. so boring to me it's so boring like i i it's 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 usually um, it's a Ted talk, man. It's usually a Ted talk. Mm-hmm. It's like, here's the good. It's more, it's moralistic and here's the good. Here's the bad. Just don't do the bad. And I'm like, well, it's not that easy, you know? Right. Or most of them are like, here's seven ways to fix your marriage. Here's seven ways. Right. Brother, you know how to fix your marriage. Quit being a self-righteous, selfish prick and repent. That's how you fix your marriage. Yeah. As soon as I figured that out, that helped my marriage. That fixed my marriage. <laughs> I am a jerk. I am mean sometimes. I, you know, I'm like, I need to repent. Like, I need to serve. I need, you know, it wasn't from reading seven ways of healthy marriage. Right. You know? So I think, but then, you know, I'll read, if I read a Protestant and I read St. Ambrose, it's just not even close. It's just not even close. So yeah. I, that's where I'm like, it, it all kind of bores me now at this point. And mm-hmm. I, I, I don't mean that in Oscar Wilde sense where I'm bored of everyone. I mean it, we, all you have to do is compare the two. And it's just, it's not even close to the depth and the wisdom and the knowledge that comes from the church and the fathers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, we are, yeah. we are bumping up against two hours now. This is, this is, it didn't feel that. Um, so no, that was great. is there any topic that, that we didn't touch on that you'd like to touch on? Anything you guys got coming up? Just keep praying for us. Keep praying for um, our direction. Keep praying for our souls. Keep praying for wisdom. Um, we're getting destroyed in our hometown. We're just getting destroyed. Oh so, goodness! Oh. Um, yeah, it's been bad. I got. I mean, I got. I got pastors preaching sermons on me. <laughs> so, oh wow! Okay, it's disgusting. It's so weird. It's just so weird. But um, yeah, we're getting hit pretty hard. We're getting hammered. Okay. Hard in our home team. and so and i don't say that like we're victims and i know god's got it but there's a there's a level of viciousness and slander that is just i've never seen it before i've just never seen people this upset yeah well 
I mean, you know, they say, uh, you know, the blood of martyrs feeds many souls. So, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you won't be called to, to maybe that extreme, but, uh, you know, God. You told me I'm going to be the Pope, bro. Huh? You announced it. I'm going to be the Pope. You told me I'm going to be. Oh the Pope. yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. So, <laughs> you know, so whenever you're elected to the, uh, to the to the papacy, maybe then you can uh, impose an interdict <laughs> on the entire uh, town of Masula. But anyway, <laughs> all right. Anathema. Well, uh, anathema. anathema. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, all right. Well, cool. Yeah. Well, uh, Scott, thanks for so much for your time uh, and for you, you're dear. Welcome, man. Dear, dear listener, thanks for sticking around this long. And if you stuck around this long, thanks for watching. God bless.